Welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, being here today, and I want to thank the, the Archives and the Music Foundation for the opportunity to speak on this topic of lay ministry, and especially the story of a few of our lay pastors um, and the Sunday School Movement specifically that took place between 1840 and leading up to about 1940. And uh, that was the greatest time of growth in the southern province. I want to uh, tell you a couple things that brings me interest to this project or what increase, uh, intrigued me to know so much about it. I had the opportunity to teach at Salem College between 2002 and 2006, and I think there was another um, semester later where among the things that I taught was something called Moravian Experience, which is uh, Craig Atwood kind of built the class before I took it. I was taken over for him initially and so you would take that class at night you, it was three hours one night a week and you would experience something like go to the brother's house and do all the cool things that kids from school get to do only as an adult and then talk about it the next week and so forth so there's a lot of interactive things about that time was the printing of with courage for the future and so that became the textbook and in fact um, Dan and Richard, we're really happy about that because it put that book into a second printing, which is a big deal if you've ever attempted to print a book, which means I've read the book six times, I've taught the book six times, I've had uh, classes engage it from different directions, and it's given me a particular perspective that serves me well now. Um, also, I have firsthand experience serving f more than 15 years collectively, uh, King Moravian in Stokes County and Grace Moravian in northern Surrey County, which has something to do with this story. And so I've had direct um, firsthand experience as a pastor to some of the people we're talking about or to the imprint they made on other generations that I interacted with them. And I'll say more about that um, as we go forward. Coming out of the 2010 Synod, we arranged churches in groupings called Regional Conferences of Churches and that particular RCC is the Mount Ararat RCC. So that meant the whole time I served in King and, Mount, and uh, Grace in Mount Airy, I was a part of that RCC and worked directly with the folks of uh, Crooked Oak, Willow Hill, and Mount Bethel that are, are very much a part of this story. And then most recently, being with them in worship events. Most recently, the Apple Blossom Festival at Willow Hill just this year. So a source that I would direct you to look, if, if, you were, if you have a copy of With Courage for the Future, there's a section entitled Sunday Schools and Preaching Places Early On, and then most importantly, a dedicated section about Christian Lewis Wright's entitled The Man Who Saved the Southern Province. Uh, so I want to speak just for a second about Sunday schools and preaching places. The Sunday school movement is interesting, um, and it is what it sounds like. Um, you went to church to, to experience school, but that might include arithmetic, learning how to read, other basic things about education, because the Sunday school system preceded public schools. When we use that term in the southern province, it has two histories. So when the Moravians came to this area and to the Wachovia uh, colony, we'll call it, they brought with them that tradition. It was just beginning in England in the 1750s. We love education, right? We brought that with us. But by around the 1850s, the records say it was waning. So attendance at Sunday school was waning. And I'm not going to speak to that particularly, but I'm going to speak to a second movement when it was used a little later. And when I, if we were doing what they did the second time around, we would call it house church movement. And that's really what brought about a lot of growth. Um, but I want you to know the story around that. Um, so I wanted to say that. The other thing I, to begin with, I want to take you to the 1830s. And while uh, ministry in the Wachovia area, and in, in, uh, as we know, Moravians and Forsyth County in particular, there's, not, there's less than 10 churches. Um, the, the Moravian church pretty much stayed flat membership-wise from 1808 till about the 1850s. I'll explain that in a minute. But in the, in, and when the war came, some of that membership dropped off because people went off the war. Um, war brought with it an economic um, depression that's worse than the Great Depression of the 
20s, 30s, and 40s in this region, um, it, was, it was worse. So membership gets back to about break even, in, in a, well, I'll tell you that story in a minute. But what was going on in the 1830s is a group of lay men and, uh, that had an inspiration to uh, set up preaching stations across the region. We weren't the only ones doing that, or what we now call full communion partners were doing the same thing particularly the Methodists and the Presbyterians, and that's how the Presbyterians functioned from day one as settlers from particularly the UK came to the North Carolina area. They actually get the credit for camp meeting, not the Methodists. The, the uh, Scotch Presbyterians did it first, but that was the thing. Our expression by the 1830s was setting up spaces where people would gather to hear uh, preaching and maybe experience worship. I just think it's interesting it was mostly lay people that facilitated a lot of that. A very important figure at the time was Van <coughs> Neiman Zevely, and his partner initially was Augustus Schultz. And together, uh, along with the PEC at the time, they formed what became uh, the Home Mission Society. A particular focus for Zevely was to go up in what they called the hollows, so if you're driving up to Mount Airy and you kind of get to the crest of the hill before you go down into that valley, that was the, we call it the hollows. And just above the hollows, if you're going up Ward's Gap, which is Main Street, out of Mount Airy um, into the area of Mount Bethel, that's where the focus was. So there were some preaching stations there. Zevely and Schultz especially had been going up there in the 1830s and 40s. And the note that they make, and this is what I like to say, particularly if I'm with um, the folks in the Mount Ararat RCC, is what was known about Christians in that area, it's a fairly sparsely populated area, is that Baptists and Methodists like to argue. That what would uh, sometimes be a public gathering were Christians arguing and fighting with each other. And, and they did that in Europe too, so that's not like... They invented it, it's just the thing. What made Zevely and Schultz so strange is they would not argue. In fact, as they engaged people, their kindness was what was most attractive. There's a particular story that's told in With Courage for the Future about a local outlaw who had become sort of, I think of Jesse James, now retired, living with the grandkids, hiding off somewhere, somebody like that, and he encounters Zevely talking to his grandchildren on his porch and distributing things that you can read that kids would like. And he had such an appeal to them that they wanted to hear what he had to say that that made the, the gentleman want to listen and invite more encounters. And so my point being is that that grew eventually to what would later become the ministry we know today as Mount Bethel, Willow Hill, Crooked Oak, and Grace Moravian. As a pastor, I had the privilege of meeting two um, legendary educators in Virginia history, um, uh, Margaret Leonard and Virginia Hyatt. And they, along with a number of their cousins, were public educators originally from Willow Hill. If you're familiar with the story of um, Laura Ingalls Wilder, they were educated at the same institution. Um, while they didn't make a TV show like Little House on the Prairie, that's exactly how they functioned. Um, Margaret Leonard particularly was a person who was uh, graduated high school at the age of 16. Ratford University paid not only for her undergraduate studies but her master's degree while she at 16 began teaching in a one-room schoolhouse. And one of the things I learned from her was how much more civilized that was than the way we do it now. But it also meant that those teachers had to have the ability not just to care for the person, uh, let's say intellectually, but for their spiritual souls. And if you knew Margaret Leonard like I did, um, recently at the Apple Boston Festival, there was probably more than 100 people in the room. I asked them to raise their hand if um, they ever had an experience with Margaret Leonard, and pretty much everybody did. She was just a very impactful person. Everything I'm about to say could be said of her. Kindness, directness, you knew where you stood. She had a way of correcting you, and you appreciated it but never with anger, never with meanness, never with acrimony. Uh, and always with an emphasis on getting to know our Savior in a personal way and having passion for our faith, 
that leads to wanting to cooperate ecumenically with other Christian groups. Uh, as I move further, the other thing I want you to be aware of is as you're thinking about this period of history, the southern province was not truly independent. It didn't have its own synods and elect its own PEC until 1857. So in the 1830s and 40s, we're still depending on um, decisions being made in Hurenhut and being passed down, and that actually worked fairly well. But when you think about the way we think today, we weren't an independent province. So how do you find leadership? How do you appoint people to do things? When you see the Holy Spirit moving and you want to build something quickly, how does that work? I mean, my, my head gets in a knot very quickly trying to imagine how they were able to do it. The real story starts in the 1840s, and this is mostly captured in With Courage for the Future in the chapter called The Man Who Saved the Southern Province. If you were to say that to most folks older than me, they're, they're going to think you're talking about Edward Ronthaler. And Edward Ronthaler came to the southern province at the age of 35. He came in the, in the 1870s. He, first, he came to be not just the pastor of home church, but eventually would be a bishop and a member of the PEC in sort of our version of Albert Schweitzer. Uh, he was effective at four different careers at once. And on the day of his funeral in 1929, the North Carolina legislature suspended business to attend his funeral. He's also the man that elevated, uh, in my opinion, elevated the Easter sunrise service to the degree that we all grew accustomed to, 40,000 people showing up. It's on radio all over the world. So we would say Edward Rontaler. That statement, the man who saved the southern province, was made by Rontaler about Christian Lewis Wright's. And quote, the chief architect of growth in the Moravian church in post-Civil War, and to which he went on to say, without him, the province would have disappeared. Why would he say that? Christian Lewis Wrights was born on June 22, 19, uh, 1820. He was born to Joshua Wrights and Salome Phillips Wrights. At, at just 19 months old, his mother died. So here in Salem, if we went just a little, maybe a half a mile north, somewhere between here and the highway, between, it was a forest, and they lived somewhere in, into that forest. Uh, his father uh, and other children at that time were not, did not have a lot of access to education. He did not. His father remarried very quickly in uh, Elizabeth Reich writes, and she became the main source of Christian Lewis's education as a young man. He entered the membership of the church at 18 uh, with baptism. He was reluctant to join the church because he felt unsure of his own spiritual condition. And that self-doubt proved to be a powerful thing that helped him empathize with people, but maybe also something uh, that, that gave him a particular view of things that's a little different than most of the Moravians that I know. As he joined the church, he became a member of the single boys' choir, or, or young men's choir. Uh, there was a severe protracted struggle with uh, a sense of being forgiven, but it gave him a lifelong sympathy for sinners, he said. He trained as a print setter. That, uh, that would be the people who make our newspapers back then. And he quickly left Salem and uh, actually received his studies in Greensboro. They were completed in 1841 at the age of 21. He moved to Salisbury to help the local newspaper and be the print setter. And since there's, there were no Moravians there at the time, he joined the Methodist Church. And that's really important because he gets a lot of influence from the Methodist. There he met Elizabeth Balfour Hughes, and they were married in 1842. So when he returns to Salem in 1844, he rejoined the Moravian Church. He began working with John Christian Bloom as uh, the printer, and he began teaching at the factory school, teaching boys. It was a free school. Um, he established a reputation very quickly for leading house church worship and preaching in a very practical way that a lot of folks really appreciated. His father allowed his own house to be one of those spaces, and at that time the home was located in what used to be where Fairview was, in the Liberty neighborhood. They, that's how they referred to it. Um, th at that time, he became noticed by Van Newman Zevely. Uh, 
who had already been doing all this work up in Surrey County and in the Cane of Virginia area. And he quickly got him to become one of his partners. The PEC president at the time, Henry Van Vleck, um, asked him to uh, become involved, and he became one of the principal teachers and preachers in 1845 in the Mount Airy Cana area. C.L. Uh, uh, Wrights was um, that featured preacher the first year, but then calamity happened again. That's the, that's the thing in his life. Um, the school closed. So the school was pr providing part of his income. Print setting was providing part of his income. So he needed to step away because now he's a father with young children he wanted to provide. And this is what I find most unique. The PEC said, wait a minute. We've got to figure out what to do. He did not want to go to seminary because his wife was pregnant with her, another child. And so they decided something truly creative. The Wrights moved in with the Huberners, who were about to retire from ministry at Freedland, and Samuel Huberner and his wife homeschooled Christian Lewis Wrights, enough so that he was ordained on July 4th, 1847, into in, in ministry at Freedland. Self-doubt popped up again. It, uh, back then, very few churches were paying their pastors enough. I mean, that, that we're talking poverty level. I don't mean that facetiously. And he needed to step away again to find other ways to provide for his family. The PEC reached out, and the Baggy family, who had a profitable store here in Salem, decided to sponsor the Freedland congregation to the tune of $250 a year to keep a pastor and so Lewis or Christian Lewis Wright's returned to Freedland and continued. Our story gets interesting that upon that return in 1854, he began experimenting with what he called revival preaching. So if you're a Methodist of the day, there's a stereotype for that, and there's pieces of it, but he made it Moravian, and that's what I find most unique. Uh, he was called away from Freedland in 1854, and in the summer of 1858, he decided at Friedberg to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the August the 13th event by holding a week-long revival. He partnered with Methodist pastor friends, some of them lay preachers, and it meant that you had a service every night. There was different kinds of music. Yes, some of the camp meeting music that people were starting to be interested in, not so much the Moravians in Salem, but everybody else. But he never preached hellfire and brimstone. I want you to hear that. He preached kindness and what we're accustomed to in the Moravian church. So he did that at Friedberg for a week. And then he crossed the river and he did it at Macedonia for a week. And then he crossed the river and he did it again. And this went on and on for five weeks. I can't imagine preaching once or twice a day for that long. You know, we're talking uh, almost 40 days. While this is going on, you can imagine the Moravian folk that are hearing about it, word got all the way up to the northern province, are getting a little bit, uh, let's say, uncomfortable, just wondering what this is all about. But by the end of the experience, 51 people joined Macedonia, and 41 people joined Friedberg with professions of faith, which was a huge burst after everything had been flat for so long. The movement was accused of not being Moravian enough, like we always do with things we're not familiar with. <laughs> News reached the northern province. There was commotion and concern. There were lots of assumption. This was just Methodist emotionalism gone wild. So a delegation of three were sent to check it out, which included George Frederick Bonson, the PC president, and the brothers Emil and Robert de Schweinitz. They took a good look and said, keep up the good work and God bless you. There was accountability as we've always had it at Synod, and Synods were more than three years apart at that time, so the next scheduled Synod would be 1861. Note that. Things continued. There was a second revival in October of 1848 at New Philadelphia. This time, two PEC members uh, were part of the planning of it. The third member was actually on mission to the Cherokee at the time. It mirrored what had been done at Freedland and Freed, in, uh, Macedonia, Friedberg and Macedonia, 
in that he included other Methodist speakers, lay speakers, and different types of music, but it continued to feature the kindness in the message and the love of Jesus. I think about the, what gets captured in the lyrics of Jesus Makes My Heart Rejoice. So this, this sort of fervor continues to grow from 1858 up to the Senate of 1861, and, and so those, there was a pretty good split about, you know, should we allow this to go on? Let's talk about this at Senate. Everybody's getting excited about Senate, and uh, there's no Senate because there's a civil war. So the next available opportunity for Senate would have been actually 1864, and that couldn't happen because the war's still going on. So by 1865, and now we've been at this seven years, not only did they, did they have a discussion, they decided, you know what, revivals in the style of worship are not inappropriate and they're not, innocent, they're not essential. But at the same time, we need to be sure we don't make them essential. You hear, hear that, that nuance? There's freedom in worship um, and, and there begun to be a better appreciation. Here's the striking thing. Guess what they did with C.L. Rice when one might think he was going to get defrocked you know, in 1858, they elected him to the PEC. The Southern province, again, membership had been flat from 1808 to, to 1858, while the population around us was growing. By 1870, in uh, post-Civil War era, uh, membership in the Moravian Church had kind of returned to pre-war levels. People had returned and kind of gotten settled in, I suppose. Um, but between... 1879 and 2000, membership grew so much that we had grown more than 500 members across the province, from 1,500 to 2,000. The Senate of 1880 elected C.L. Wrights the president of the PC. It also elected the new pastor at Salem, at a home Moravian, Edward Rontaler, to the PC, and these two became really important allies. A super, one of the greatest resumes, if you want to say, in Edward Rontaler, and one of the most natural um, learners in, in CO Wrights. And if you think about their ages, they're kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, Edward Rontaler was sort of not young, but youngish, 35. And uh, at this point, um, Christian Lewis Wrights is towards the end of his lifespan. By the time of his death in 1891, the province had gone to 2,771 members. So notice that just increasing. It's like each segment of five years, it was almost an exponential growth. The turning point of this story is 1883. Everett Rontaler and Seal Wrights uh, were approached by the Northern Province Senate and the Southern Province leadership about the, the consideration of merging it had been given con uh, serious thought for quite a while, and when it came down to that decision, what it boiled down to was how many churches in the southern province were solved, that we're in the midst of our worst economic um, depression we'd ever experienced, and only Bethania and home church were solvent. Everybody else was in sort of a deep hole, and it looked as if that merger had happened, those churches would have been closed. Everybody would have been closed but Bethania and home. And so, in kindness, Wrights and Ron Toller said, we're not going to do it. And they came back, and what they launched, we now call the second Sunday school movement, a house church movement. In order for it to work, and, and I'm, you know, I've told the students to try to wrap your head around this, it, in the middle of the Great Depression, which my grandparents lived through, uh, my grandfather particularly had five jobs. This was worse. I can't imagine what people were doing with their spare time. So if one of you wanted to be a Sunday school leader, in other words, you're going to start a group at your house that might eventually become a church, you had to come down here and get trained for over a year to be certified. And husbands and wives did that together on top of all of their work. So between 1877 and 1929, and I say 1929 because that's what when we began what became known as the Board of Christian Education, and this became a sort of a call job, 25 churches were started out of this movement. And the membership of the church went from 2,779 to 20,000 people. 
What I find most interesting, too, is that uh, we were preparing for a synod. I think it was the 06 synod, and the question was asked, uh, what are the different kind of synods that we've had? We had kind of the ones I grew up around. You know, we met at, you know, we'd meet at home church and eat it down at Sedham College, and it's a le- a purely legislative, and we just moved to Black Mountain, and there's sort of a retreat aspect to it and sort of a blending of the two. And, and, our, and I remember asking this of Richard Staubach, and, he said, and he, he goes through the digital stuff in, in, uh, with Courage for the Future, and he says, actually, there was a third one. So between 1877 and 1929, um, those who were involved in the Sunday School movement would gather the year before, probably more like six months before, and you would swap ideas. We'd call that crowdsourcing these days. What's working? What's not working? How can we help each other? What do we need from Synod to keep this going? And the reason they stopped doing it is it's hard to do that with 20,000 people. You know, even if you're sending representatives, we don't know each other like we once did, where we know each other by first names. We're, we're kind of like that now, but you get my point. I, I'm wondering if something was lost when we made that shift. Now, um, I want to sort of bring this to a focus, um, and this is purely my opinions, and these came from teaching at Salem and purely from with, with Courage for the Future. So I want to, my disclaimer is it's not the only source of information but it's an awesome source of information. And if you read through it, what makes it unique is all of our story is is, uh, segmented in decades. So each chapter is basically a decade. And if you look at it, you realize that if you were to go down um, to Old Salem, Inc., and you're you're me and I'm a kindergarten or second grade, whenever it was, that we got to go to the brother's house and experience that, you're experiencing the colonial identity where the choir system's up and running, there, there's uh, great uh, commerce in Salem, but there's also ministry going out to places like the Cherokee. And we think that's always been our identity, but it's the first identity. The second identity comes between 1818 and 1865. There was a Senate in 1818 that decided that women could no longer vote, that worship could no longer be integrated racially, And an outcropping of that was the beginning of what would be the Provincial Women's Board, and the first thing they did was help build a church that became St. Philip's. But we became more about the local culture and blending in uh, from 1818 forward. And then what I just described to you, that third identity, 1877 to 1929, that Sunday school movement. I'm a child of Freeze Memorial, one of those Sunday school churches. Um, But again, 25 of the 30-some churches, um, I think there was 35 at one time in Forsyth County, were all out of that Sunday school movement. And now there's a new identity that's being formed. And what that will be is our challenge to figure out. One of the downsides, if you can say that, now when we were doing this Sunday school movement, 1870s and forward, and it it, it brought to the fore lots of lay leaders, lots of lay pastors, lots of lay folk through the Sunday school uh, process itself, so, did the, so were the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Lutherans doing the same thing. So this, this was sort of a cultural thing across the board. All of us would say, um, and leadership would say, we traded the big M for Moravian or the big M for Methodist or the big P for Presbyterian or the big L for Lutheran for something smaller and sort of a generic Protestantism. We became very reliant on... Um, uh, larger publishing houses for curriculum rather than knowing our own story. So that's why I say this new identity that's forming has come out of things like Gemeinschaft, people re- re- rediscovering the ground of the unity and the covenant for Christian living and, and sort of finding ways to live into it and rediscovering who we've been all along. My concluding remark, and I think this is what made this lay, this lay ministry so vibrant, is this. Um, to understand Moravian theology today, it's understood best if you're still in a choir. You know, imagine that day when you would have gotten up and uh, your day would have begun. I, I would say this to my students at Salem. Imagine that your day began with people in your same walk of life. Uh, if, they had, if the uh, women had stayed together, particularly the single women, and started a, a, a divorce choir group, I don't know if they would have done that. But so let's say they had then your day would have ended 
after dinner with a group of people that know exactly what you're walking through. And they can work with you to live exactly what the, all those things, the ground of the unity, remnant of Christian living, would mean for you in this moment. I remember this particular mom who was a single mom uh, going for a new career said, that seems a whole lot more sane than the church I know today. And I said, it does to me too. But as long as we try to be Moravians without that kind of in-depth caring for each other, it's like having, I always compared it to a nuclear submarine in the Navy, it's like we're missing the reactor. We're going through the motions and it's a beautiful tradition, but the main thing that made it what it was was that deep abiding faith that came from some group that loved you every day, that you spent time with every day. So that takes me back to Mount Airy. That takes me particularly to the folks around Willow Hill and Grace Moravian. And looking at that older generation that would have been starting their careers in the 1920s and teaching at that time, and they instilled that faith at Grace Moravian in places like that, um, they, they were still able to hold on to that tradition somehow. I wonder what we need to do today with that. I don't think the answer is the clergy. I think they're a part of it. I think the answer is the laity. 